Energy Speaker Series program. I'm Ben Hill. I'm with Georgia Tech's Venture Lab program, and it's wonderful to see so many of you here. It's also wonderful to have all of you on the webcast participating, no matter where you might be. I would like to welcome Minister Barker, and thank you uh, and express my thanks for his uh, participation in today's clean energy program. I'd also like to thank Council General Malins for her vision in including Georgia Tech in the minister's visit to Atlanta. Uh, I'd also like to thank the ministers and the Council General's staff for their support and other members of the UK government for their support in making this uh, program possible. I'd also like to welcome Ms. Sweeney and her staff from CNN International and glad you're here today as well. Uh, just a few other little comments. Uh, did you know today, this is, this is the 22nd program of the Georgia Tech Clean Energy Speaker Series. Since its inception in 2009, the series has examined the role of clean energy and clean technology in leading the energy demands of this region for the next 20 years. And uh, in addition, the series has considered the uh, importance of not only energy as a, uh, on the surface for its intrinsic value, but also the importance of energy as an economic driver, national security, the creation of successful new ventures, uh, building political consensus, and now today, international cooperation and global growth. A number of folks make this series possible, and uh, I'd like to uh, recognize them for their support. Uh, as you see on the uh, slide, um, the, we have uh, groups like uh, uh, Sutherland, Asbill and Brennan, McKinsey and Company, South Face Institute, and Georgia Tech Strategic Energy Institute, as well as the Brook Byers Institute, for Sustainable Systems, the Enterprise Innovation Institute, ATDC, and Venture Lab. In addition, the uh, Clean Energy Series has a stellar group of advisors, and I'd like to recognize them and thank them for all their support in making this happen. Marilyn Brown, Valerie Thomas, David Scholl, and Santiago Gravala, all of whom are on the faculty of Georgia Tech. Um, Jay Hakes, who's the director of the Carter Library, and Ken Ostrowski, who's director with McKinsey and Company, provide invaluable advice. In terms of logistics for today, um, as you know, the, this program is being webcast, so using the microphones will be very important to include those who are not here with us but are engaged uh, over the internet. So. Um, when you ask questions, please be sure to use a microphone, and I will also have index cards should you not want to ask a question, but won't, still want to ask a question, not ask a question verbally, but still want to ask a question, you can pass out index cards should you want to write those questions down, and we'll pass those to Ms. Sweeney. Um, the, um, so also during the Q&A period, for those of you who are participating over the, by the web, you can email your questions to me and I will pass them along. My email is ben.hill at georgiatech.edu. That's ben.hill at g-a-t-e-c-h dot e-d-u. So uh, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Rafael Braz, provost of Georgia Tech, who has a few remarks and will introduce our speakers. Dr. Braz. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Council General Malin and Minister Barker, it's a pleasure for us to have you here. I'll uh, say some more words in a second about that. Welcome to Georgia Tech, all of you, and welcome to the Clean Energy Speaker Series program. Clean energy, as uh, in reading a little bit about the minister, I was very impressed about the concept that we completely agree with that is an opportunity and a necessity. It's a necessity because we need to essentially uh, steward our world and provide for our people and grow economically. And it's an opportunity for growth and it's an opportunity for industry uh, of all types. It's certainly one of the economic sectors that has the most growth in this nation 
and across the world. I believe that the United States, in many ways, simply cannot ignore, and if I may say so, concede the leadership in this area. It behooves us to be as aggressive as possible in making sure that we lead the world uh, in the clean energy area. Let me talk very quickly, because we have a lot of people that, and certainly visitors that may know not a lot about Georgia Tech. But we, we are in a, in a university that is really full spectrum, the part, but it's centered on science and engineering. It's really a 30,000 people city with 20,000 students and 10,000 other people, including faculty and staff, researchers, and all sorts of individuals that work every day in research, in education, which is our main uh, purpose, and also in economic development. Uh, that is uh, one of our key roles, and we recognize that Georgia Tech has a responsibility of economic development. As part of that strategy, energy is, is crucial. Uh, as part of our responsibility as one of the top universities in the world, and certainly in this country, we must investigate, we must improve the knowledge base in all key strategic subject matter that face the world and face the nation. And energy is one of them. Uh, sustainable energy, clean energy. Recently, just a few weeks ago, we had an energy security forum here, uh, the Samnon um, Bank of America Forum on, on Energy Security, an extraordinarily successful meeting that brought the leadership of uh, energy in the region and the country and particularly the leadership of the military, which is um, the, the largest user of energy uh, across the world. Quite an impressive uh, numbers if you start looking at them. We are leaders and work very hard on photovoltaics, on solar energy of all types, on batteries, on wind, on smart grid. I heard several conversations about smart grid. Oh, in a few months, we'll be opening a brand new facility, the Carbon Neutral Energy Systems Facilities, which is a $40 million building. A lot of it, about $12 million of that financed by the Department of Energy, the rest by us. That is really intended to serve industry as a place where we can prototype almost at full scale a lot of the combustion turbine work that goes around here and in our partners, industrial partners. Uh, so the bottom line is that, that we at Georgia Tech uh, welcome very much this type of activity and would love to engage uh, with Britain in, in, in working to resolve the needs of the world in this area. Uh, as I was talking to the minister earlier, we're all over the world and we certainly would love to be in Britain. So uh, we certainly would love to explore further those possibilities. I repeat, it's truly our honor to welcome uh, the Honorable Gregory Barker, uh, Minister of State, Department of Energy and Climate Change. Uh, he graduated from the University of London in 1987, was elected in 2001 as a member of the parliament uh, from the Conservative Party, has had considerable business experience in, financial, uh, uh, in the financial arena and particularly public relations relative to investment and financial arena. He's a committed leader of the green economy, something we need more of around the world. I, I must end by saying that I find it very refreshing and wonderfully uh, exciting to see a minister with the title Energy and Climate. Uh, given that uh, certainly in this country we have struggled uh, recognizing the value honestly, of both independently and certainly together, uh, which I think is crucial to the future of our country and the world. With that, once again, welcome all, particularly welcome Minister Barker, and let's receive him with a warm applause. Thank you. everybody. Um, my name is Fanula Sweeney and I'll be moderating this session with the Minister over the next hour or so. And as you heard earlier, if you have any questions at some point, uh, the session will be only as interesting and as vibrant as you make it. And so 
uh, please just raise your hands if there's a point that you would like to jump in on as we're talking, and then just make your way to the microphone. We'll try to keep it as fluid and as vibrant and as interesting as possible, as indeed as the subject is itself. Um, Minister Barker has been here in America for the last week or so. Um, what was your purpose, and how is that going? Well, I've been here for a week in the States, uh, starting in Washington and New York, but really kicking off in earnest in Texas on Sunday when I was joined by five British businesses ranging from world-class engineer Rolls-Royce uh, right the way through to uh, a new uh, small business S helping other SMEs um, in energy uh, uh, efficiency services. Um, we've, had a, we've got a, uh, a business specializing in insurance risks, particularly climate change. Um, we've got uh, a business that is a smart grid uh, business, a, a private equity backed venture. Um, we've, um, across, the, across the board, we have a, a really exciting uh, range of businesses, including uh, Jupiter Asset Management. We have billions under management, but and, uh, a particular leadership in sustainability issues. And the, the real message is uh, this. The opportunities in the clean tech sector are manifold. It's not con uh, uh, just constrained to one narrow part of the economy. But there are a number of big growth opportunities for a variety of businesses, from manufacturers to financial services, from energy efficiency to uh, smart grids, um, uh, really uh, waiting for opportunities to exploit not just those that present themselves in the British economy, but globally. And we're here to share, we're here to learn, uh, we're here to make new contacts and do, do business. And if people are watching, and I should say welcome to the webcast as well, those of you who are watching uh, uh, online, um, how would you describe Britain today as in terms of green energy? How would you describe the average Britain's mindset when it comes to the awareness of green energy and indeed climate change? Well, let's be clear. We're in a tough, challenging economic environment in Britain. Um, the deficit that David Cameron inherited in 2010 was the largest peacetime deficit any government has ever had to tackle. And our mission is very clear to reduce that deficit um, to get public spending under control, uh, to cut taxes and get the economy moving. But I think my clear message is there is no contradiction between getting the economy moving, getting growth going, and actually being able to rebalance towards a new, competitive, prosperous, low-carbon model. It's actually a huge opportunity now to lead the rest of the world um, into pros prosperity based on low-carbon growth. And that was a wonderful answer, but it wasn't my question. <laughs> I know that David Cameron has pledged to have the greenest government ever, but in terms of the average Britain and yes. how their mindset has, has evolved over the last few years, because I've been, lived in London, I should say, for um, about 15 years, so I'm, I'm interested personally in, the, in, in your answer. Well, I think we are lucky in the UK. A lot of people uh, do take uh, sustainability and green issues very seriously. We see again and again polling shows that the consumer does want uh, sustainability embedded in their lifestyle. When they go and shop, they want to eat sustainable food and they want you know, to eat healthily. Um, when they're at home, there is an increasing interest in energy efficiency. Um, but the, it, cost is the key. They, they don't want to have to pay more for it in a difficult economy. And that's so, the question. Is green energy you know, compatible with cheap energy? Well, the key is long-term, secure, clean and affordable energy, and that's what we're absolutely um, committed to providing. We saw under the last government um, a collapse in an investment in new infrastructure for both clean and traditional forms of generation in the early part of this decade. And what that delivered was a very short, for a short period of time, for a couple of years, relatively cheap bills that stored up problems for the future. And the Cameron Coalition is very much about addressing long-term issues now, not ducking the hard choices. And in terms of the long-term issues now, there are those who would say, and I don't want to dwell on this, but I feel I must raise it, um, that perhaps in the coalition government there are elements of your party that may not be in favour of investing in green energy at this time. Well, what we do see is a strong consensus about the need for uh, clean, affordable, secure energy. And what we want is a diverse portfolio. Now, Individual members of parliament will have their own particular technologies that they favour. There's obviously a strong lobby for nuclear. Others, you know, who push uh, very enthusiastically for offshore wind. Um, others who are championing um, marine energy. Um, so there are different views on which, which 
uh, element of that mix should be favoured. But overall, what we want at the centre is a strong, diverse portfolio, not picking winners, but ensuring that we, ha we encourage innovation right across the spectrum. Um, and that's why I'm here at Georgia Tech, because this institution has a global reputation for innovation, particularly in the clean energy economy, and we want to you know, learn and share and exchange ideas. And, and speaking of being here at Georgia Tech, is there anybody who has any questions they'd like to raise at the moment or any points that they would like to touch on? Um, it's a little early in the game, perhaps. You're all a little shy. <laughs> okay. But in terms of where you see yourselves working and the British government sees itself and business sees itself working with business here in America and universities, let me ask about universities in Britain and how much research is being done into green, clean energy moving forward. Well, you can't avoid the deficit and need to uh, reduce uh, public spending across the board. But it's very interesting, when we had the big spending review uh, in 2010, the government went out of its way to protect spending on science um, and protect spending on uh, innovation. And within that, uh, low carbon innovation has a very important point, uh, place. Um, there are key sectors that we've identified um, and clearly the green economy clean tech industries are one of the areas where we think the UK has a globally competitive advantage and protecting that science base and, it, and driving forward R&D um, to a point where it can be commercialized and taken up by the private sector is absolutely key. And we've, we've done a number of things to put that uh, long-term framework in place and protect those budgets for essential research. And why do you think Britain particularly has a global advantage? Well, I think we've got four things going for us. Um, which really uh, mark us out from the crowd. Um, firstly, our geography. Um, we have with our coastline a huge capacity for renewable energy, um, particularly offshore, wind, wave, tidal. We now have the largest single wind farm in the, anywhere in the world deployed uh, in the Thames estuary with the London Array. But we're set to become the Saudi Arabia of offshore wind, a huge uh, resource. Is it as, uh, will it reap as many rewards as it has for Saudi? Well, in the long term, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, but you know we've got to be got to be patient, and you've really got to put in uh, the foundations. Um, there isn't a, a, a quick win there, but it is the right thing for the long term. And the important thing in deploying these uh, technologies, like wind, wave, tidal, um, onshore wind, biomass, solar, um, which uh, is enjoy enjoying strong growth in the UK now. Um, the important thing is you can't just deploy these technologies when they're subsidised. You have to reap the benefits of the whole supply chain. So the coalition really has had a step change in encouraging the manufacture of these technologies in U within UK. It's not sustainable to deploy these at scale when they're reliant mm. on public subsidy to begin with if you're simply importing the kit, the technology from abroad. So we place a strong emphasis on building up our manufacturing base. And if you look at economies that have already done this successfully, like Germany, um, they have done so in tandem with a strong um, uh, policy to encourage enterprise um, and growth on the back of the of renewable energy. So in terms of renewable energy, obviously there are lots of business opportunities and research opportunities, not just within the UK, but also globally, and particularly here in the US. But when you come to the average Britain, I mean, when you have high class prices as a stable in our society, which are far worse and far higher in Britain than they are here in the United States, and people often complain about the price of gas here. Um, I found it actually a, a wonderful relief. But um, the pressure of high gas prices, how does that feed into the pressure on businesses and households? It, it's, it's, it's very simple. Sorry, for, I forgot to tell you. I said there were four key things, and I gave you one. Just very quickly, the other, the other three points. Firstly, it's our geography. Secondly, it's our world-class research and development, not just places like Imperial College and Cambridge, um, Manchester, Edinburgh, Southampton, but we really have world-class R&D. I'm keen to see an, a global exchange and further that. Um, thirdly, is that we have a great uh, workforce in, um, in the UK. Um, we really do uh, have a, a both managers, entrepreneurs, and, a, and uh, a workforce that are up for risk, up for change, um, aren't stuck in their ways, are open to new business models. Um, and then fourthly, fourthly, it's not fashionable to say it, but actually the City of London is a huge resource. More, more uh, investment for clean tech and global green goods and services was raised last year in the City of London than anywhere else in the world. We are head and shoulders 
the market leader, and I am determined to make sure that London builds on its reputation as being the go-to place for international investment in the clean tech sector, and that we build the, the financial products that are available to a whole range of industries. Well, that uh, leads me nicely on to the Olympics, but just to... Do you want me to answer your gas question? Yes, exactly. Sorry, but, uh, out, just to, <laughs> let's, completely let's, out of the sink. Let's, uh, let's get into sync on the, the gas prices question, but that w then we'll move on to the Olympics, great. of course. Um, on gas, um, you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a worry. On one hand, in the US, you've got this extraordinary shale revolution that has pushed the, uh, the spot price of gas down to just $2. Um, but last year, uh, in Europe, it was a 35% increase in the price of wholesale gas that actually was one of the biggest breaks on economic growth and nearly snuffed it out altogether. Um, so we're very aware that while there is huge potential uh, globally for uh, unconventional gas, we mustn't get carried away. It hasn't yet arrived in the UK, and we've got to be very thoughtful. We want to make sure that we develop that resource if, that, um, if it can be done in an environmental um, secure and in a sustainable way, and we certainly want to take advantage of it. Um, but it's not there yet, and in the in, uh, certainly in the UK, um, energy, energy bills driven by rising fossil fuel prices are a big concern. So we have to make sure that we don't add to that concern by overpaying for renewables or right. overpaying for clean energy. Absolutely right, that as the prices come down for renewables uh, and certain renewable technologies, that we make sure that the subsidy you know, tracks that full and that we be very clear that subsidy is only an interim step and that, you know, we, we have to aim to make sure that policy delivers renewables that are um, uh, comparative with fossil fuels, you know, within a sensible time frame. Otherwise, it's just not viable for the long term. And just before the Olympics, the individual house owner and homeowner, how much does this government encourage home improvements that can make their house more energy efficient? Well, now you're, I'm going to play my joker because this is a flagship policy for the coalition. We will be launching uh, this autumn uh, something called the Green Deal, which is a totally new way to fund energy efficiency improvements in the home, whether you're a homeowner or in the private sector or in the social rented sector. Um, and whereas there have been other government programs before to encourage it or subsidize uh, lagging, weatherization, as we'd say in the States, um, this is about much, much more than basic measures. Um, it's going to allow um, each home to spend up to £10,000 um, on measures for their property um, as appropriate. And those measures can then uh, be paid for by attaching the charges to the electricity bill of the property. And it stays with that property and repaid over 25 years. The important thing is the golden rule. The, the golden rule says that all of the financing costs of those measures, and the measures will vary, and the cost of measures will vary from property to property, um, but the, the co financing costs must always be less than the savings that those measures generate. So that from day one, even accounting for financing costs, the consumer in that home will always be better off. Um, but by bringing in a stable, regulated way of financing it, and spreading those payments over 25 years, it's not personal debt, doesn't attach to the family that live there. Um, it's not credit scored. It is simply attached to the, uh, to the energy bill of that property. We're creating a brand new market that is going to be aspirational. It's not just about things that people know they ought to do, but will deliver the opportunity to do the things that they want to do, like mm. LED lighting, new glazing, mm. new doors, um, things that are more traditionally associated with home improvements rather than just mm the sort of worthy energy efficiency agenda, but it's also going to future-proof our homes and make them more attractive, but also cheaper to run. And, you know, it will mean that the UK moves from being in a place where you have uh, high energy bills, despite the fact that we have relatively competitive energy prices, mm -hmm. to an area where actually we, we start to look the rest of Europe in the eye. Do you know that the average home in the UK costs more to heat than homes in Norway where they're partly in the, not the Arctic Circle because they leak so much, and we're, we're going to change that. All right. Let us move on to the Olympics. Coming up in a couple of months, um, lots of preparations, lots of uh, reports about security, lots of focus on security at these Olympics, but also praise from the UN Environment Chief for what Britain has been doing in terms of its planning for the, the London Committee for um, buildings. Legacy has been one of the mottos of the the British approach to these Olympics, but sustainability is also very high on the list of priorities.
Absolutely. We're very proud of have it hosting the Olympics this year. We're getting very excited. Got, first of all, we've obviously got the Jubilee, and we're very excited about that. But this summer, the world is going to come to London. We are absolutely ready, um, and the British taxpayer is uh, reassured that not only have we completed on time, but we've delivered on budget. Um, and I think a lot of that is a tribute to um, Mayor Boris Johnson and to uh, Sebastian Coe of the uh, London Organising Committee. But you're right, we don't just want to put on the greatest games, we also want it to be the greenest games ever. So we have put a lot of thought into not just how we build the uh, Olympic Park and the various um, venues to make sure that we're using uh, a maximum amount of recycled materials, that it's on brown field sites, that we're using CHP. I opened the CHP plant that's underneath the Olympic Park. Uh, the, uh, the Olympic Park. Um, but also we are thinking about that legacy issue. So many of the um, sites are going to be taken down and re-erected re elsewhere. I'm hoping that my constituency is going to benefit from uh, one of the swimming pools. Um, and uh, believe it or not, you can actually take the hole somewhere else. <laughs> um, but the, um, ac across the board, we really have been trying to ingrain um, sustainability in the whole mindset of how we're putting on uh, and delivering the Olympic Games in London. And back to a question of cost here, has the cost of trying to do all this for the Olympics meant that the, the investment has been greater? Um, well, actually, as I said, it, it's been delivered on budget, and, and actually the cost of doing these things can often turn out cheaper. Um, often it's about doing things more smartly, thinking about whether you really need all of the kit bills of bells and whistles um, that, that go with a uh, conventional... Um, procurement process and also thinking there are smarter ways to do things and certainly energy efficiency is the no-brainer um, by saving uh, on energy and also other resources you embed resource efficiency in your business model as all of the firms who I've brought to the US know actually that's a saving that's not a cost and will help drive profitability and again just to go back to this question of you know hard times in Europe very hard times at the moment um, and Britain is a part of that mm. scenario that facing people for decades perhaps to come. Um, some would say, I would argue, that investment in green energy has fallen as a result. And as a result, that it will be difficult to find the investment going forward to the degree that it might have been well, you're present before. Well, you're absolutely right that investment globally has fallen. Um, in London, we hosted the Clean Energy Ministerial a fortnight ago, and McKinsey and Bloomberg New Energy Finance um, presented a set of figures which made pretty grim reading that show that for the first time in nearly eight years that uh, investment in clean energy globally had fallen off quite dramatically in Q1. Um, and that's largely driven by the de uh, big decline in US uh, onshore wind. Um, now, there's a reason for that. Um, obviously, it's a difficult economic climate, and just like everybody else, the uh, clean tech sector is is affected by the same pressures and drivers on mm -hmm. investment. Um, but at the same time, um, here in the UK, US, the uncertainty around the uh, future production tax credit uh, for renewable energy is having a chilling effect. And obviously, we want to get, you know, until the, uh, uh, that is resolved, I think you are going to see a hiatus. Um, Do you envisage the um, investment government budget for clean energy remaining the same? In the UK? Or, in, or, or increasing, yes. Well. We are absolutely clear that we want more for less. Mm. Um, we are continuing to uh, push the, the uh, clean tech sector, whichever technology, to provide more for less sooner. Mm. Um, it's absolutely right that the, the green economy, which some people, um, you know, tend, especially on the left, tend to think sits in a bubble and is somehow separate from the rest of the economy. Um, we're clear, you know, everyone is tightening their belts. Everyone is having to squeeze their margins. Um, everyone's having to rethink how they cut cost out of their <coughs> business model, and the clean tech sector is no exception. So we but do want we do want technologies to look to see how they can really commercialise sooner, mm -hmm. how they can make do with less subsidy, and how they can deliver um, cheaper, cleaner, secure energy as part of a, a strong mix. So, do you see the the, the investment budget? Expanding. I mean, it's, the, well, we the, don't the, quite fund it that way. Well, the green economy is expanding yeah. something like four percent a year yeah. in Britain. I mean, do you see the terms of the backing and support for investment in technology continuing? Well, we do. In the UK, one of the uh, things that we've done since coming into office is 
uh, pledged to create, and we're now, we've just had the uh, Queen's speech in the UK where we've announced the legislation to create Europe's first green investment bank. Um, and we're capitalizing that with uh, just under $5 billion. Um, and in due course, that institution is going to be able to go into the markets and raise its own capital independently of the government. Mm. Now, that is a very significant pledge of new money into the green economy that's going to really put the UK at the forefront of clean tech innovation um, and deployment. Mm -hmm. um, we have found that money at a time of austerity, not because um, you know, we've made an exception for the green economy, but because we see it absolutely as an integral part of our plans for growth, recovery, and long-term prosperity. Let's switch gears a minute and focus on the US and on your trip here recently. What specifically have you learned from your US counterparts or your business counterparts here about the future of green energy? Well, I think the biggest takeout is very simple. You can't ignore the shale gas uh, revolution. Mm. And I think there are still a number of uh, answers that need to be worked through. Um, but it clearly poses a dramatic challenge to many of the conventional economic assumptions mm -hmm. around the fossil fuel uh, renewables debate. I mean, over the last two years, we've known that the politics of uh, low carbon have been challenging here in the US. Um, their failure to pass a cap and trade bill um, has meant that the politics, by and large, for, for a variety of reasons, have been very, very uh, uh, difficult. But the encouraging thing was that the private sector was really showing mm -hmm. uh, leadership and, and uh, investment was up. But when you change the counterfactual away from imported oil or from coal mm -hmm. to very cheap gas, that does present a challenge. And I think we have to make sure that we don't just pretend it's otherwise and do take account of the fact that you know, cheap gas is here to stay. I mean, there are various people I've spoken to here who say that $2, two gas is um, a short-term glut but you know, four four dollars, maybe six dollars max. Um, it's clear that cheap gas per se is something that's going to be with us for a very long time. Now the question is, how do we make the most of that? How do we turn that into an opportunity? Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I think we need to put a lot more emphasis on carbon capture and storage. Mm -hmm. and I think there are there is big potential to work more closely with partners in the USA. Mm -hmm. In the UK, we recently announced. Uh, one and a half billion dollars uh, for a new CCS project in the UK and a commitment to further projects behind that. Mm -hmm. It will be the world's single largest uh, demonstration project at industrial scale. And there's a lot going on, maybe at a slightly uh, quieter level here in the, U the USA around CCS. And I want to see more of that coming together. And I think that's a, an area where we could see significant advances in the next few years. Anybody have any thoughts on this in the United States? I mean, I'm interested in the fact that uh, private business here seems to lead the way in uh, renewable energies more so than government, because traditionally in Europe, it's often government who tend to lead the way. Is that a, is that a good balance that you have in Britain between business and government? Um, I think so. Let's be clear. The solutions and the delivery is all going to come from the private sector, but there's a very clear responsibility on government, not just to clear away the barriers, but to have a strong vision of where we want to take the economy and to create a, a, a pro-business framework that allows innovation and deployment to flourish. Mm -hmm. And I like to talk about TLC. Um, not, tender loving care. Not tender loving. <laughs> well, that's good. We all need that as well. But uh, transparency, longevity, mm -hmm. and certainty. Mm -hmm. And while if you're going to come into government and change the trajectory, um, so to a more ambitious level, change is unavoidable. Um, but what we're looking to do, um, first with the changes that I've made to the feed-in tariff scheme that we inherited to make it more ambitious, to look to more deployment, but mm -hmm. at the same time getting better value for money, um, and what we're trying to do with our ref larger reforms of the electricity market is to create that long-term certainty for investors and for uh, business, both existing players and the new entrants we want to come into the market, that they can invest with real certainty um, in the UK because it's going to be a place where the government is a genuine partner in the development of uh, these new sectors. What is your, you mentioned the electricity market, what is, is your sense of the credit markets? I mean, they are said to be in disarray. Why do you think 
or do you believe indeed that there should be more investment, um, particularly perhaps arguably, arguably by the United States participating in this? Well, it is tough. Um, anybody looking to uh, borrow money, um, whether you're looking to get a large bond issue away or whether you're a small firm looking to a, for a loan from your local bank, you know, really ha it can struggle at times. There have been obviously um, examples of, of companies that are being more successful, but you know, for, for the majority, these, it's, it's tough. That is why we've created the Green Investment Bank, and we'll be deploying something in the region of $1.2 billion this year um, into British business supporting the green um, uh, sector. Um, but the idea of that is not to just throw good money after bad or to look to subsidize uh, non-profitable projects, but to use that as bait, effectively, mm. to crowd in private sector investment and to get the liquidity flowing. And that's why we're committed through um, to supporting things like the um, Green Deal Finance Company, which is uh, a not-for-profit uh, organization which has been created by the major participants in the energy efficiency market that we're creating in the UK um, to help them tap into the bond market in a new way and create a new asset class mm -hmm. um, for energy efficiency. We, you know, the, the good news is that you know, in London, we have in the city a genius for financial products, um, for inventing new uh, products that are right for the time and right for the investment challenges of, of the day. And I've absolutely no doubt Although it's challenging, we will continue to come forward with products that match the investment requirements of the economy. It's because private industry sees that green energy, renewables, profitable. Absolutely, and it's, it, it is the future. As part of a balance, you know, and I think we do need to be realistic. I don't, you know, I think in the past, maybe those of us, you know, and I've been guilty of this myself, of, you know, who, those of us who feel very passionately about it do occasionally get carried away drinking the Kool-Aid. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got to consistently you know, check yourself and make sure that you're still supporting a really strong, rational economic case that takes account of the latest economic environment that businesses find themselves operating in. And that's what I consistently try and do, is just bring it back to how we're going to make sure this actually makes profitable sense for new entrants and businesses. Questions, anybody? Yes, sir, if you'd like to come forward to the microphone. Thanks very much. My name is Rich Simmons. I'm an alumni of Georgia Tech and also was born in the, in the UK, so I have sort of a mutual uh, interest in this issue. But I want to delve into your uh, point earlier about a reasonable time frame to bring uh, renewables to market. And it ties into the last discussion. Uh, wh what are your views about developing that strategy that is sort of appropriate for one year and two years and the time frame of the elected officials? as well as the 20-year and 30-year time frame that we've been talking about relative to the climate goals and the long-term planning and making the policies uh, jive with what the consumers and the voters uh, really need to see happen over the long term. Well, thank you. in the UK, we're very lucky um, in that we have cross-party support for the Climate Change Act. And to give credit to the uh, previous government uh, of Tony Blair, um, they passed the uh, Climate Change Act. It was David Cameron that first called for it, and there was cross-party support, but it was the previous government that actually uh, passed it through uh, and enacted it. And we continue to have a uh, consensus about, uh, firstly around, broadly speaking, the, 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 uh, the science of climate change, but also the fact that we do need to reduce our carbon emissions. And indeed, last year, the coalition government passed a carbon budget that will take us right up into the mid-2020s. Um, so there is a, there is a long-term plan to reduce our carbon emissions to the point where by 2050 we will have reduced them by 80% compared to 1990 levels. And that gives the overarching architecture to all of our policy. Now, of course, um, the opposition will critique our individual policy levers um, and will criticize and scrutinize um, the policies that we put in place. But that is a very helpful overarching um, uh, navigational tool and our policies must be judged by their ability to deliver those uh, outcomes and I think in terms of subsidy for um, renewables it is important that we put in, in place long-term uh, arrangements and get away from the sort of stop-start programs that we've seen in the past um, with electricity market reform we're doing that we're moving towards a, uh, a system of 
feed-in tariffs, in our case contracts for difference, but we've seen how feed-in tariffs in Germany and other places have worked uh, over the long term to drive sustainable investment in Sorry, renewables. let me interrupt there. How do they work? I'm not familiar with Contract that in Germany. Contract for difference is that, um, basically in a, in a feed-in tariff where renewables are guaranteed a price um, for their energy at a level that's commensurate with the cost of generation to give a predictable rate of return. Right. And so they guarantee a, a rate of return. Now, there are different types of models of feed and tariff, mm -hmm. but basically a long-term commitment to taking uh, the electricity produced from electricity generation at a price which will allow a, a decent mm -hmm. return for renewables. You've been... Oh, actually, any more questions? Yes, please. Um, yeah, firstly, uh, uh, just an observation. I was back in the UK uh, a few weeks back, and it's quite encouraging to see in, in my... Uh, uh, town where I grew up, uh, um, increase the number of uh, solar panels for residences, which is pretty encouraging. The uh, the second point I'd like to uh, address is something that's not really talked about that often, and that is the cost, not necessarily financial, but the cost of clean energy. In particular, I'd like your thoughts on um, the uh, controversial onshore wind farms um, uh, in, in areas of outstanding natural beauty in the, in the Welsh countryside. So I'd like your your thoughts on that. Sure. Um, well, onshore wind is an important part of the mix. Um, onshore wind is actually the cheapest um, to deliver um, in the current state of uh, technological progress. Uh, but I think it, it historically, certainly under the last government, there was an over-reliance on onshore wind. They were very much one cup golfing to the exclusion of a range of other technologies. And I think I said earlier, what we want to see is a strong balance of a diverse uh, energy supply, and that applies to diverse renewables as, as well. Um, so we are putting a lot of effort into making sure that other technologies are able to be deployed, particularly offshore wind. Um, I've created something called marine energy park, parks in the UK um, to ensure that we actually make the most of uh, wave and tidal power uh, as well. But onshore wind will continue to be an important point, uh, 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 element of that mix. But we reckon now, it, if you add up that which is already built, um, that which is currently being, being uh, uh, developed, and that which is in the planning system, in totality, that is enough to meet our 2020 renewables targets. And I think you know, the specter of, of uh, paving over the, most of the Britain's beauty spots with uh, onshore wind um, has been slightly over-egged. And I think as a government, we certainly don't want to see the desolation of areas of outstanding natural beauty. We want to see local people have a stronger say, a louder say in where these things are deployed, and where they are deployed, deployed maybe a little bit more sensitively than they have in the past to respect the landscape and, and communities. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, Minister Barker. wanted to get back to your um, take on the shell gas play here in the States mm. and worldwide and the role of CCS, because I'm perplexed as to how it is that the UK can have so much more interest in the CCS portion of the system than we have in the US, which of course is so much deeper into the actual production of shale gas today. Um, you, you probably know that the EPA has um, promulgated some regulations that there won't be any new um, power plants built here unless they um, have less CO2 intensity than a natural gas plant. Not a natural gas plant with CCS, but an uncontrolled um, natural gas plant. And so there's so little motivation to be exploring in the absence of a, a carbon tax or climate goals. But in the UK, you have your climate uh, change levy, I think is what it's called, um, a levy on carbon, um, and you have your your... EU trading system, um, so there's a, a market now for CO2 credits. So is that what is uh, promoting the CCS? In the US, you mentioned Secretary Chu brought up the idea of, did you call it uh, something like um, a kind regulation or was that the term smart. he meant? Smart regulation, okay, smart regulation. I do think that that is what we need. Do you have smart regulation in the, in the UK now? Well, one of the things that we are legislating for as part of our electricity market reform is something that I brought home from California. Uh, while we were in opposition, I took uh, 
uh, a great deal of uh, inspiration from Governor Schwarzenegger. Um, and there in California, they pioneered the emissions performance standard um, to ensure that they didn't build new unabated coal. Um, and we will be legislating for our own emission performance standard. Now, we want to see new gas plant built, but over time, we want to see new, uh, the additional gas plant as it comes online, particularly as, we, as CCS becomes um, uh, economic, which it isn't currently, we want to make sure that it, it is actually deployed at scale. But before we can insist that industry adopts carbon capture and storage, we've got to prove it. Um, and it, it is not a cheap undertaking. That's why there is cl a clear role for government to uh, pony up, in our case, uh, uh, $1.5 billion, um, working collaboratively with industry to make sure that we get the CCS solutions. Now, in the UK, we're not just being uh, ethical, um, but we're also being uh, industrially smart, we think, because the UK, thanks to our heritage of um, expert oil and gas exploration in the North Sea, um, thanks to our heritage opening up uh, the mines and places like Imperial College, which have a global reputation for um, innovation in fossil fuels, we have a huge amount of uh, expertise that can be turned on its head as to how we then sequester the carbon and store it uh, back in natural reserves. And so we're really wanting to draw on our heritage in oil and gas and coal and use that because we think if you can crack the CCS market at scale, it's going to be a huge global industry. Because what is clear is if the world as a whole is going to keep global warming, man-made global warming, at a, to a reasonable level, it can't do that with renewables alone. And for decades to come, we're going to need to deploy fossil fuels. And we'll have to, and in, as we get into the 2020s and 2030s, that's got to be done with carbon capture and storage. So we're giving it a, a jump start. I'm Dennis Creech with the South Face Energy Institute. Uh, you've mentioned a couple of times about the importance of restructuring energy utilities to help you achieve your uh, clean energy goals. I wonder if you might help us uh, understand a little bit more how that process has gone. Um, well, we're not restructuring our utilities because unlike most states in the USA, we have a totally private market in the, in the, in the UK. Uh, Margaret Thatcher privatized the electricity sector, so we have um, not as much competition as we did when she was in office because there are fewer participants. We hope that will change, but we do have a, a, a private uh, sector. So what the role of government is to create um, a regulatory framework that drives strong competition um, and creates um, a good base for long-term investment. That's our role. But the actual firms themselves, the utilities, they're in private ownership. And what we're trying to do is encourage greater competition. I actually hope that we'll encourage some more US companies um, to come to the UK, particularly those that are you know, looking at energy in a very smart way and understanding that the changing economic model of, of uh, utilities is not just to sell you ever more increasing amounts of energy, but to manage energy on your behalf and actually to deliver a service rather than sell a commodity um, and use technology to, to do that. Um, so lots of the ESCO companies, for example, uh, over here, I think, could, could find a very willing market in the UK um, for their, uh, their services as well as their energy products. You touched on a point there. I'm wondering, is it, is it sustainable for the UK market to grow on its own, or does it specifically need international companies to come in? Absolutely. We, we already uh, are dominated by international companies in the UK in the uh, energy sector, and uh, we want more. Um, hi, I'm Mary Hallisey Hunt with the Strategic Energy Institute here at Georgia Tech. Um, there was some conversation that went on at, a, at another event this morning, and I would like to ask you to speak a little bit more um, to risk assessment and how that shaped the view for energy and climate change in the UK, and maybe translate that to how it might help the US as well. Sure. Um, this relates to a, a meeting that we had this morning with the Atlanta Metro Chamber of Commerce. And we were talking about the obligations on companies um, to uh, report uh, on sustainability measures and, and carbon. And I like to see this not just in terms of sort of fluffy CSR, but actually about transparency and risk. You know, the banking crisis of 2008 had many causes, but one of the major causes was the fact that so many investors who were buying these products and buying these stocks were just unsighted on the huge 
hidden risk that there was because of the different types of high-risk asset that weren't, weren't visible um, to the, uh, to the uh, retail investor. Um, in exactly the same way, uh, we think that companies need to be much more open about their risk in terms of their exposure to the carbon price, about their exposure to uh, constrained resources, and we want to see greater resilience in the uh, corporate supply chain. And we think that you know, companies who are going to grow and prosper in the future in a, an increasingly resource, and I'm going beyond energy, um, in a resource-constrained global economy are going to be those that really manage their resilience and manage their carbon uh, and resource risk in a way that is much more transparent and responsible. I think those are the companies that are prospering. Interestingly, I launched um, a uh, carbon index on the Mumbai stock, or Bombay Stock Exchange, as it's still called, uh, in India last year. And those companies that were more transparent mm. um, on, their, on, on their carbon disclosure actually outperformed the rest. It was very interesting. But then that's talking about changing a mindset as well. Yeah. Or are you, do you think government should be involved in trying to, to make that happen? Well, I think we're, we're, we are currently looking at issues around mandatory carbon disclosure uh, in, and carbon reporting in the UK at the moment. The important thing is that you don't get too far ahead of companies. There's a sort mm -hmm. of sweet spot. We're very mindful about imposing more regulation at a mm -hmm. time when companies are already struggling. But I think that's clearly the direction of travel. I'd be interested to know what people here in the U.S. think about this because the argument about the role of government here is so much, I think, in, more intense than it is in Europe, although that may change with the European crisis at the moment. Yes, sir. Hey, I'm Ben Deutschman from here at Georgia Tech. And it sounds like you recognize that um, over here, cities and states are kind of leaders and innovators. So I'm wondering what you're, you might be doing um, in the U.K. to empower local councils and mayors to, to take a lead and to get involved in some of these issues? Um, you're absolutely right. Here in the US, there are some marvelous models. Um, I've just come from uh, San Antonio, and uh, Mayor Castro, with his Mission Verde, is, you know, it was amazing for me to go to Texas uh, and see a, you know, the seventh largest city in the USA, having a real sense of purpose and a very clear vision about how they're going to deliver energy efficiency, how they're going to grow renewables across a range of technologies, um, and we're thinking about the long-term uh, environment they needed to make sure that happened and the partnership they saw with the clean tech sector in Texas. Um, so that was, that, was, uh, that was great. And of course, the fantastic stuff that you're doing here in uh, Atlanta. Um, in the we added UK quickly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, the, uh, but in the UK, um, I think you will see, particularly when we launch our Green Deal, this energy efficiency program that I was talking about earlier, I think it's going to be the big metropolitan authorities that are really going to show a clean pair of heels on this. Um, and the sorts of plans that I know, big corporations, not just Boris Johnson in London, but also uh, Birmingham, Manchester, Coventry are looking at creating a whole low-carbon hub and a sort of local micro-economy yep. to make sure they don't just install efficiency, but they get attract companies to become a manufacturer uh, and grow jobs in the area. Uh, Newcastle, Gateshead, fantastic things going on uh, up there. Across the country, there are some really exciting local uh, initiatives, and I think that's also one of the, the the light motif of the coalition in the UK is that we're really trying to devolve not just power but sort of economic authority back to local people to allow them to exploit um, the things that are right for their cities. You seem satisfied with that answer. And um, just a personal question: having lived in London, you know, so many of the buildings are quite old. Yeah. Um, and just going back to aging infrastructure, how can you? see the cost of that being minimized to allow people to take advantage of any offers that may be on offer or indeed to just make their home greener? Well, by creating this new market, that means that everybody's going to have an opportunity to retrofit thousands of pounds of uh, installations into their home at no upfront cost is going to change the whole scale and scope of the market. And for a lot of things, there hasn't really been a great deal of progress in either in price or uh, efficiency of, the, of some of these products, for example, solid wall insulation. Only now are we starting to see real advances in that product. Um, and I'm very excited about some of the things that I'm seeing, but we still need to go further in driving down the cost. And you won't get that cost mm -hmm. coming down until it's deployed at scale. So we're creating the market, and if you create the market incentives, then the products will come, we believe. But the, the key is 
you know, investment in research and development, um, and then creating that long-term signal, because companies won't come and invest in developing new products if they see it's only a you know, one-year or three-year program. But with the Green Deal, this is a 20-year proposition mm. to retrofit you know, over 20 million homes. So this is a big market, and mm. suddenly a lot of people are saying, well, that is worth getting involved in. This is worth spending investment dollars um, to develop new products, both to increase their attractiveness to the consumer and also to drive down the cost. So it's all about you know, scale and efficiency. I mean, can you envisage a situation where houses that are perhaps listed might be unearthed to a certain degree so that new wiring or plumbing can yeah. be put in? Yeah, um, I think we have to be clear. In the UK, there are a lot of um, historic properties, um, listed um, properties. We shouldn't be starting with them. Um, there are still some things we need to develop before we start um, unduly tampering with uh, the very older properties because you can make mistakes. If you seal, um, thermally seal a, a, a property uh, inappropriately that hasn't got a, a, a damp course, um, you can do all sorts of damage with, with yeah. unintended condensation, for example. But there, is 90, you know, there are millions and millions of properties that don't have that problem that we should be focusing on first. But we are working with groups like the National Trust, English Heritage, people like Kevin McLeod, who's a well-known TV presenter of uh, uh, DIY programs, are helping get public acceptance for this, and working to um, make sure that we get the right smart solutions for those older buildings. Because if we do mess up on sort of landmark buildings or buildings that are you know, much loved and cherished, that would have a disproportionate impact on other people in, in maybe newer homes mm. uh, and their willingness to take up these innovations. So we've just got to be sensible about the rollout, but I think we can do it. Um, and also, the, the, one of the striking impacts on one's life living in London is the congestion charge. And to those who are not familiar with it, it means that I think it started in 2002, and at the time it was five pounds to drive into the centre of London within a demarcated area. and that rose very quickly, I think it was to seven or eight. Yeah, How much is it now? It's eight pounds now. Eight I have pounds. a congestion charge freak. Um, yeah. I drive a hybrid, so uh, fortunately, I don't pay that. You hybrid. don't have to pay yeah. that. So, I mean, without getting into politics, Boris Johnson had pledged in the last, when he was elected, he was going to, re to remove the congestion charge. That didn't happen. I suspect it's unlikely to happen. But do you see it as a model for other cities, not only in Britain, but say perhaps here in the States? Yeah, I mean, we've just had a mayoral election in, in, in London and uh, glad to say that Boris was returned. Um, and uh, actually, the congestion charge didn't really play a big mm -hmm. role in that. There are still people, particularly small traders on the, on the edge the of fringes, the, uh, on the yeah. fringes who uh, have to be taken into account. But I think people were more uh, excited by Boris Bikes, this uh, mm -hmm. system of, um, of uh, bikes that you can hire and deposit at different um, uh, returning stations across the city for a, a nominal amount. Um, that got a lot more attention, and that's an encouraging sign of where the transport debate is going. The other thing that Boris is doing is investing you know, uh, in Crossrail, which government is supporting, huge infrastructure projects. Um, so congestion charging, I think, um, is part of a suite of solutions, and each city has to work out what is right for them. But I think putting a, tr a, a genuine cost on the price of carbon and, putting a, you know, and making sure that polluters pay for... Uh, um, their actions is the right thing. Otherwise, there is still a cost there, but it falls disproportionately on those who've done least to uh, create the pollution. And in terms of the hybrid car solution, I mean, there are a few parking places in London, in central London. Is that something that's going to continue to grow? I mean, I'm talking about this in terms of the United States, if there were congestion charge zones um, introduced here, just how much planning is needed and forward thinking about people changing habits yeah. just to start to use hybrids in well, years, the years to come? Hi hybrids, I think, I think you're thinking of electric cars. Oh, um, I beg the, your pardon, yeah. Yeah. So, but uh, hybrids, you don't have to pay the charge. You don't. At hybrids, you don't have to pay yeah, the congestion charge. charge. The electric car is but the electric the cars, you actually get, free, yeah, they, you yeah, get right. free parking yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, and they're, and they're, we're rolling out a national scheme of, of electric mm. charging points. Now, my car's a bit bigger than the average electric car. It's a sort of... Um, Ministerial... Uh, we, have a <laughs> we have a ministerial ele ele um, electric car, which we've been driving a Leaf the last the, the week before I came out. But I was talking about my car. But the, it's these very small smart cars, the electric mm -hmm. cars, and we're doing lots to encourage those. And there mm -hmm. are the rollout of plugs. And I think they're starting to capture people's imagination. Mm -hmm. And when I switched to my new um, 
hybrid, I just I became really boring. I just couldn't stop talking about how much it was saving me, not in London, but driving down to my constituency mm -hmm. and coming back again. And for at least, I don't know, a couple of months, my, sub, my staple subject of conversation was, do you know how much it cost me to drive down to Bexhill? Yeah. And how much does it? Um, <laughs> I can get that <laughs> on, a gal, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, about a gallon of petrol. Okay, that's which, amazing. Is, which is amazing. How yeah. does that conversion to leases in the US? Oh, so God, now gallon. I wish I'd have paid attention right. um, mm -hmm. to maths in <laughs> okay. school. All right, um, let's move along. Um, yes. Yes, we haven't talked a lot about the sort of global carbon trading, cap and trade, you know, whatever version it might be. I assume that's because it's not politically very popular, but we've talked a lot about how encouraging private sector to invest and innovate is very important, and I completely agree. But the easiest solution to that would probably be a global cap and trade or some price on carbon. Is that not really talked about just because it's not politically going to happen, so therefore we have to do all these other complicated projects you're talking about to try and induce? Or, you know, sort of what's your stand on that? Well, you're absolutely right. We need a global price on carbon, and that will come with a global market. Absolutely right. That's the most important, single uh, most important thing that we could do. There was a glimmer of hope, actually, at, uh, at Durban. Um, we made quiet progress, and I think the UNFCCC needs to go through a period of, you know, under-promising and over-delivering in order to get you know, the credibility that we lost uh, after Copenhagen in 2009. But it was an important step taken at Durban where all of the major economies, in fact, all of the countries of the world came together, including the US, to agree to agree a, <laughs> a treaty by 2015 that would be implemented by 2020. Now, I don't underestimate... No the, room for maneuver there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't underestimate you know, the barriers that have got to be overcome, the obstacles in our way, the pitfalls to agreeing that, that treaty by 2015. But it's absolutely imperative that we do so because while there are a whole other suite of measures um, that each country can take and the private sector is absolutely key, we do need that price on carbon. We have an, an efficient uh, emissions trading scheme in the EU. The price of carbon has come right down but you know that's because it's a market-based mechanism, and you know look at the economy and do the math. Um, so you know we need a global price for carbon if we're going to stimulate uh, low-carbon investment, not just in the UK or Europe or even the US, but also in China, India, and all of the developing economies as well. So it's sort of a parallel track. You guys are thinking of both of that, and then in the meantime, trying all these other regulations we're talking about. Yeah, I think doing as much as we can now, um, and just being realistic about the prospects for. A, a, a global treaty. Um, it's not for us to interfere in, in, in domestic US politics, but you know, we need a global, a global market, and that's what we're continuing to push for. I mean, it raises the question about, um, on a more general level, governments come and governments go, and different governments have different agendas. Do you think in Britain there is an absolute commitment, no matter which party is in power or parties, to green energy and making Britain a green country? I think now that, you know, that ultimately you can't take the electorate for granted. And I'm always very cautious about sweeping statements like, like that. I think the British public have decided that they want a cleaner, greener Britain, uh, that they want one that is compatible with clean, secure, and affordable energy, and most importantly uh, of all, one that will continue to deliver uh, long-term prosperity and get the economy growing again. I think. It's up to governments to show that they can deliver that, and there's a range of policies, and I think we've got the right policies in place. Um, but you know, the public will keep holding us to account and demonstrate that, that we're actually coming up with the goods to deliver. And do you believe, just to refer to a question from uh, someone earlier, that the local councils and the local authorities, which do so much and have so much influence over the cities and towns, can be pivotal in this, rather oh, than yeah. big governments in Westminster? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think... You've seen a real revolution in uh, the UK of, uh, in recent years with transition towns, mm. with lo small local communities really just taking personal ownership of this agenda and driving visible change in their communities, whether it's retrofitting their homes, whether it's putting in local renewable energy sources, um, whether it's um, putting energy efficiency into pub their local school or their local mm. um, village hall um, to larger you know, city-wide plans. Um, and often that comes down to local leadership. Have you got the, you know, people who are capable of The message of has got through to local leadership. But it's happening and it's viral and that's that, that, that bottom-up growth is the best of all. All right. Yeah. I'm hoping I'm not repeating the same questions. I'm interested in the 
uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, the Green Deal. They're a bit, a bit sure. heightest, they <laughs> aren't they? Um, I'm, I'm interested in the Green Deal, um, a little bit towards the people. Um, you can just hold it. Hi, I'm sorry. Um, going back to the Green Deal, how does it affect family, you know, uh, homeowners again? I have in-laws and a lot of friends and family back in England, and I understand that they've been trying to get uh, solar power. And I know that uh, end of last year, there was a panic because suddenly the program that they had had shut down. So is this taking place, the 20-year the program that we're talking about? Right. How does it affect, sorry. Okay, there, there are two, two distinct things. The Green Deal is about energy efficiency. It's not about micro-generation of electricity. So, although the Green Deal, is set, so it will start with someone coming into your home and telling you the things that you can do to save energy. But as part of that assessment, they'll also tell you that it might be a good idea to put solar panels, or maybe a micro CHP boiler, or renewable heat, um, ground source heat pump, or an air source heat pump, or, or whatever. But the things that generate electricity aren't actually financed through the Green Deal mechanism. That just finances energy savings, because there is this, it's all financed through this golden rule, which says, basically, if you go save energy on this, cut out waste on that, cut on waste on this, um, you're going to create a number of savings, and from those savings, you'll be able to finance the cost of those measures. Um, what you're talking about, I think, and that program hasn't launched yet. It, doesn't, it won't launch until this autumn. Um, what uh, you're talking about, I think, is the fact that we cut last year the rates that we were paying for our feed-in tariff for solar technology particularly. Um, you saw a tremendous fall in the cost of installing solar last year. Over the last 18 months, it's come down by over half. Um, and uh, we had a fixed tariff. And what happened was a tariff that was originally supposed to give uh, consumers who invested in solar panels a return over 20 years of about 5 or 6% per annum was suddenly seeing 10, 12, 15% returns. So there was this huge wave of people saying, I'll have some of that, um, <laughs> who were driven not by the, uh, just the fact that they thought their home was suitable for solar, but they just wanted to get their hands on a government-guaranteed income stream that yielded double-digit returns, uh, tax-free, index-linked. Um, so what we've done is uh, put in a um, new model, which actually ensures that there are small but regular cuts to the uh, tariff. The tariff scheme is still very much open. It's very much there. It's got more money supporting it. Um, we're going to support a higher level of deployment than the old scheme. And we're basically moving away for, from a scheme that offered bumper returns to a few to sensible returns for the many. And by ensuring that we, we keep the returns tracking down to track the costs of the technology, it means we can deploy a lot more. So if we can keep the costs coming down, provided they come down, and we get close to uh, grid parity later in this decade, I, I want to install 22 gigawatts, up to 22 gigawatts of solar power. That's the potential um, in, uh, in the UK if we can keep the costs coming down. Okay. And Another question, sorry, that I'm interested in is uh, talking about transition tariffs. I have a few friends back in England and, uh, who, who actually have formed or are leaders of, of those transitional towns in different cities like Leicester, uh, London, uh, Sheffield, different areas. If you're concerned about people being educated and knowing a little bit more about that, surely the government can have some kind of a funding to help train these people that can pass the message out to a wider, wider well, we, community. We, funding is obviously extremely tight. Um, I would love to have a limitless budget, but we, we clearly don't, and we're having to rein back public spending. But we do have funds. We've just um, uh, had a new fund uh, in the early part of this year, the local energy uh, uh, fund, LEAF it was called, um, to do exactly that, to help people that want to uh, build a uh, local renewable economy in their area and want to get projects off the ground. And it was seed funding from the government to help them draw up a plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I expect that we'll continue to come up with schemes like that to help people. Okay, thank you. <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, my name is Johnson Kaku. I'm a visiting professor at Tech. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you make sure that the, uh, the carbon market is not driven by the financial market? Because the financial market is very short-sighted. Um, well, obviously, the, a carbon market will 
be part of the financial markets. Um, I don't see that as a bad thing, providing it's responsible use of carbon credits. We don't want to see uh, carbon traded as a derivative in itself that di becomes divorced from the real economy, of course. But um, they can, we do want to see a sophisticated large-scale trading in, in carbon. That's important in, because by that happening, it makes it more available to more companies, um, to more investors, and the more liquidity there is, and the more effectively the market will work. Here is a question that um, was uh, passed to me earlier before we began. Um, climate change seems to be an accepted reality within UK government, business and society, or is it? Why or why not is this the case? What could we, the US, learn from the UK's engagement of this issue? And it goes on to say, remember in terms of a suitable answer for the South, the dots need to be connected for relevance for a local or regional context. As an example, Jim Rogers of Duke Energy has been an outspoken supporter of addressing climate change through cap and trade and uh, said a few weeks ago in Congress uh, that as much, and he got a bloody nose for it by industry peers in Congress. Well, actually, I've met Jim a couple of times. I think he's a terrific uh, and very articulate uh, advocate of what seems to be a very sensible policy. But back in the UK, I won't pretend that you know, there's not unanimity. There are still climate skeptics, um, quite respectable climate skeptics, as well as the more extreme. Um, and I think we just have to be a little, you know, down um, play the hysterics on this, um, be a little bit more uh, consensual where, pro where, where, where possible, and be accepting that science is constantly changing. Um, and what this is really about is not becoming to an absolute view on the science of climate change, but accepting the, an appropriate level of risk. And it's very clear, all of the majority of scientists are saying there is a clear link between, um, uh, man, uh, between climate change uh, and uh, industrial activity uh, and the release of carbon into the atmosphere. And that seems to be, there is a very strong consensus around that. But you don't have to be absolutely 100% certain of everything before you reach to act. Um, I spoke yesterday in um, San Antonio, and someone asked me a similar sort of question. And I said, well, if a pilot of an air aircraft said to you, I think there could be a 70% chance that this airline, this uh, airplane might crash on the journey, you wouldn't say, don't tell me that. I'm not going to change my travel plans or cash in my ticket um, until you're 100% 100% sure. You know, of course you wouldn't. Um, so you know, it seems to me that you, know, you need prudential risk. Yeah. And there's clearly a very uh, clear uh, and present danger presented by man-made climate change, and we should be sensible. But the important thing is that we don't burden our economy um, or over-react um, uh, in a way that prevents us from, us from growing in developed economies and de prevents developing economies from also um, you know, increasing the, the condition, living conditions of, of people there. So we, that's why it's important that we have no regrets policies um, that drive innovation, um, that drive energy efficiency, that are resource efficient, um, and actually underpin the competitiveness of our economies. And I think you know, through ad, um, innovation and through smart regulation and through you know, working in tandem with the private sector, it's entirely possible to do that. I'm going to wrap it up uh, shortly, but if anybody has any questions, please make their way to the microphone. Um, I just wonder what you're going to take back to the UK with you. What have you learned here specifically? And I want to ask uh, about the relationship, not between businesses in the UK and the US as much as the relationships between universities. How do you see that evolving? Well, there's plenty of scope for further cooperation, not least with Georgia Tech, which is a global leader. Um, and I think sharing that knowledge base is essential. At the Clean Energy Ministerial a fortnight ago, we signed a uh, a memorandum of understanding with the USA and between the USA and the UK um, to uh, share research on offshore wind um, and looking at how you can have floating um, installations that don't necessarily need to pile deep into the ocean mm. floorbed. Um, and I think there's a whole range across, right across the clean tech sector where we can uh, increase um, uh, our research and joint cap joint research capabilities and knowledge sharing and. You know, we've done it so well before. Um, there's a great new opportunity opening up for us. We've just got to make sure that government plays its role 
in allowing uh, the private sector to take advantage of that opportunity. Yes. Thanks very much. Actually, my question does relate to the role of uh, both government and the private sector. I wondered if the minister could speak about the marine energy specifically as an alternative energy and renewable energy, and more specifically about the governance mechanisms that are now in place, I understand, uh, in terms of the decision-making, implementation, and monitoring of both policy and innovation, the development of new te experimental technologies. Uh, could you talk a little bit more in detail about, for example, the steering committee, I understand, that is established to guide? Sure. And uh, I appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, marine energy is a, I know I've said that we shouldn't have favorites or pick winners, but marine energy is a particular uh, pet of mine. Um, and I was determined when I became Energy and Climate Change Minister to really have a shift change in ambition. The problem with uh, marine energy is because um, it is still at a relatively early stage of development. Despite the obvious huge potential, uh, in the renewable se uh, world, uh, most governments have been reluctant to invest significantly in it. And as a result, the private sector has been slow to invest in it because you're unlikely to get the quick returns that maybe other technologies offer, um, like offshore wind, for example, uh, or indeed solar. Um, the reality is we're not going to be able to generate at scale much before the 2020s. So the previous government didn't really pay it a great deal of attention because it was unlikely that uh, marine energy would help it meet the 2020 renewable target in a meaningful way. But there comes a point when you have to start thinking for the long term, otherwise you're never going to achieve it. So I created something called the Marine Energy Programme Board, which brings together all of the stakeholders in the UK. So large firms like Rolls-Royce, who are with me on this um, important green trade mission, um, to uh, Siemens, the German company, um, smaller entrepreneurial-backed um, innovative uh, companies, the local authorities, um, the uh, Crown estate that, monitor, that uh, is responsible for the governance of, this, of the sea, um, government, obviously, um, the funding and, and research bodies, um, and uh, academic institutions, so that we actually have one place for policy making and very clear agenda setting. Um, now, that is working very, very well, and I'm, we'll be meeting again in uh, Scotland uh, in the summer, where we hope to uh, launch the, the next marine energy park. Um, that's the first thing. But government has a responsibility as well for seed funding. Um, we've put uh, more money into um, funding the deployment at scale of uh, specific uh, technologies to get them into the water and proven. Um, and we've also increased the uh, renewable subsidy for uh, marine technologies. It is now the most subsidized um, uh, technology or, uh, we, that we've, we're proposing to raise it for, uh, to five rocks of our renewable uh, certificates. Um, in order to really drive this um, technology forward, um, and the marine energy parks that we're creating were really inspired by a meeting that I had um, that George Osborne, our Chancellor of the Exchequer, convened in Downing Street with uh, Eric Schmidt. Um, and I asked Eric, who'd come to talk about innovation um, to a range of ministers, what is the single thing that you, most important thing that you could do if you were in my position to encourage deployment of these new technologies, particularly like marine. And I you know, thought, was it going to be you know, lower taxes? Is it going to be a subsidy? Is it going to be um, cutting regulation? And his answer was very simple, cluster. Um, clustering is absolutely key. So these creating these marine energy parks, where well, they're um, hub and spoke, uh, certainly the first one is down in uh, the southwest. We are deliberately bringing together in certain geographic locations the financiers, the investors, the academics, the innovators, the entrepreneurs, the engineers, the manufacturing, all in as much as possible in close proximity so they can spark off each other. You've proved that model time and time again here in the US, um, and we're, we're uh, endeavoring to follow suit in the UK. And a final question. Good afternoon, Minister. Um, at the beginning, you were speaking about longevity and the importance of long-term security. Uh, and so I'm just wondering, what sort of efforts, focus does your government have on 
investing into people that is conservation as opposed to energy efficiency. Um, you put in 1.5 billion into the CCS, um, and what if you spend a fraction of that in programs? You know, I guess the congestion tax might fall into this category to change people's mindsets because you know, not using energy is 100% saving. Uh, so, what sort of efforts or um, focus do you have on people as opposed to just investment in technology? Well. I think I've been boring you to death about the Green Deal, which is our sort of flagship energy efficiency program, um, which is going to take energy efficiency to a whole new level and bring in people that aren't just focused on the green agenda, but a much broader uh, section of the population who maybe aren't engaged in energy efficiency issues at the moment, but make it attractive to them um, to get involved in energy efficiency and make it possible for them to do that by giving them access to uh, no upfront cost finance. Um, so that's important. Um, in addition to that market model, where we will be spending around £1.2 billion a year um, in subsidising the fuel poor um, and help them make their homes uh, energy uh, uh, um, efficient and those in hard to, who live in hard-to-treat properties. Because not all of our homes, particularly the older ones, um, will be able to deploy the necessary measures and make them work under the golden rule. And where they don't meet that uh, golden rule, there will be subsidy available, particularly um, for the, fu for the uh, fuel poor. And we're also um, reforming our electricity market so that energy efficiency, for the very first time, will be able to compete with the building of new generating assets um, as an alternative. And all of these things only work really if people buy into them. You're absolutely right. And I think you get permission to talk, I get, as a politician, permission to talk to people about energy efficiency if we get our own house in order. And one of the things that I am proud of and can really point to as a, as a success that we've had is reducing energy in government. In the first year of uh, the David Cameron's administration, we pledged to reduce uh, energy consumption in government buildings by 10%. And I was in charge of that program across uh, government. And it was very difficult. Lots of people said we couldn't do it. We actually achieved savings of 13.5%. And the reason we were able to do it wasn't just because we installed new technology and changed our, you know, bits of kit here and there. It was because thousands, literally thousands, of um, members of staff uh, in the civil service, officials, really bought into that program, really understood what we were trying to achieve, really supported it, week in, week out. And unless you can you know, not just show leadership, but get that buy-in from the people that you're trying to influence and consistently um, come back to that issue. You won't succeed in your policy goals. If I may add one thing. Um, I understand the efficiency program and what you're trying to do, but I'm speaking, I believe, more um, you're putting money, giving money to for people to change their light bulbs from incandescent to CFL. I'm speaking... Um, asking people to turn off the lights instead of using the CFL. Do you have anything in place for that? Well, what we don't have is a sort of government lecturing program. Okay. Um, I think there's sort of old-style, finger-wagging you know, um, uh, sort of adverts. Well, apart from there isn't a budget for um, that nowadays. Um, they, but they tend not to work. But we hope that the Green Deal market that we're creating is going to create lots of messages from people who are much better at speaking to consumers and making it an attractive proposition. The people you know, like Marks and Spencers, like Tesco's as supermarkets, John Lewis, um, who are actually uh, B&Q, the home improvement people, they're the ones that can actually cut through and speak to uh, consumers much more effective than any, any politician can. And by creating an opportunity for them to come into the market, I think we're going to get much better um, engagement. All right, thank you uh, particularly uh, Minister, for joining us, uh, Energy and Climate Change uh, Minister of the United Kingdom, Greg Barker. Thank you for joining us. I hope you found it insightful and engaging. And um, we'll see you again sometime. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.